We're going to let a few people get, get in this morning, uh, this afternoon, sorry, your early afternoon or very late afternoon if you're Dr. Maha, uh, who's at a conference in Spain and she's still joining us uh, to let everybody get in. Uh, afternoon, folks. As you know, I'm Brandon Garrett with the National Minority Equality Forum. Uh, very pleased to have this thoughtful discussion today that is being re led by our very own new mom, Mia Keys, who's back with us after uh, a little break and ha having this little accomplishment called the baby boy. Um, so we want to congratulate her and thank her. Um, I just have a just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one, make sure if you have questions that are to be asked for the panelists later on, please put them in the Q&A box below. And if you have sort of chat and some thoughts and conversation, you can put them in the chat box um, that'll appear to your right. Um, additionally, before I let Mia take over, I just want to remind you guys that this uh, April will be our 20th annual Summit on Health Disparities. So we're really excited about that. We'll get, have these conversations, but we'll have them in person, um, hopefully. <laughs> it, Lord says the same as my grandmother would say. Um, so we hope to see you all there. We'll put a drop of registration, uh, a link for registration if you're interested. And then without further ado, to make sure this conversation goes we will welcome back Mia Pease. Mia? Thank you so much, Brandon Garrett, and Thanks. to the National Minority Equality Forum family. Very excited to be back with you all. And um, as Brandon mentioned, um, I had a nice little chunk of baby and <laughs> um, very excited for, for him and for, for us, for our family, but then also for the world that he's, uh, that he's coming into. You know, And I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today in terms of the role of the potential of real world data to, you know, for the fostering of equitable access to research and to healthcare. Um, that's the world that my son's going to come up in. So I, I couldn't be more excited to be joined today by uh, by Dr. Maha Radhakrishnan. And I'm very excited that Dr. Radhakrishnan is joining us from Spain. What time is it there, uh, Dr. Maha? It's just past 5 p.m. All right, just past 5 p.m. So we want to make sure that you have supper so we won't keep you but so long, but we know that you'll feed us in a really um, fantastic way. She joins us um, as the group senior vice president and the chief medical officer of Biogen. And of course, we also have with us Dr. Gary Puckren, president and CEO of the National Minority Quality Forum. And between the two of you, I know we'll just have a, a really very deep conversation about um, the potential of real world, world evidence and real world, world data as we're talking about the expansion of clinical trials and, and, and healthcare. So I'd like to turn it over to the two of you to just give us some, you know, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and, and why people who are here today need to know about what you're doing and why, why it matters to their world. Dr. Maha, I'll go with you first. Thank you, Mia. Thank you. And uh, dinners in Spain don't start till after 10 p.m. So we have a good, <laughs> good five hour here chunk to talk good. about. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Puckerin. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this webinar. This topic is very near and dear to me. As I was telling Dr. Puckerin last night, I, it's very close to me. I'm passionate about this topic. Just because health outcomes are often dependent on a multitude of factors that are way beyond the control of patients and doctors. And many of them are like disparities that span age, gender, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic levels. These disparities, in fact, they stem from, again, a multitude of factors, but primarily because of the inadequate representation of the diverse patient populations in clinical trials. And also aspects like barriers to accessing care, among several other factors. I'll get to it later. But randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, as you will hear me say during this uh, webinar, are often considered, as we know, to be the best option when it comes to estimating the effectiveness of new treatments. However, there are limitations, as it's often a very homogeneous patient population that's studied as part of RCTs, where the diversity of the patient population at large in the world we live in is not factored in. And these RCTs have historically struggled to include members of Black, African American, Latino, and other diverse communities, essentially those who are underrepresented in particular. As I was looking up at the biostatistics last night, preparing for this conversation, what came through to me was some abysmal statistics that talks about Alzheimer's disease trials, where 1.2% on a median basis Black African-American representation, 4% Asians, 
and about 5% or so let Latinos and Hispanics. We need to do better. We need to do way better. And so, which is why, you know, a focus of my conversation today with Dr. Pakran is gonna really focus on real world evidence or RWE as we will call it during the course of this conversation, which essentially is the next level of generating evidence as part of a continuum to really complement the data that we obtained from RCTs, to be able to fully understand and characterize the patient journey, as well as evaluate the effectiveness of the medications we are studying in the real world. Obviously, RWE are observational in nature, longitudinal, so you'll be able to see the impact of the product on a patient and the family's life over the long run, and often routinely collected as part of clinical practice. And at Biogen, as a world leader in neuroscience, we are completely committed to health equity and focused on improving the lives and the outcomes of patients through the generation of real world evidence. It is our commitment to work with Dr. Pakran and others to really actively seek solutions to address the health inequities faced by the underrepresented and underserved populations in clinical research, particularly as today we talk about Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Dr. Raha Krishna, thank you so much for laying that out. I think, uh, especially given that we're coming into our April, brain, April Health Brain Trust, uh, we will have a lot more to talk about as well. Um, that'll be an extension, I think, of, of this. That'll be an opportunity to extend this conversation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Puckrin, let us know what, what your thoughts are, are on the Biogen partnership and what it is that you all are, are doing together. Um, between NQF and Biogen on all things related to clinical trials, but as Dr. Radhakrishnan mentioned, especially the work around Alzheimer's. Well, first I want to say congratulations uh, at, at Super. So Thank I'm you. so happy for you and, and the baby. So, Thank you. And, and we're glad to have you back. You know, glad to be I love back. these conversations with you. And I also want to welcome Dr. Radhakrishnan. Uh, we're so pleased to have her uh, join us and be part of this conversation. Anyone who's been around the National Minority Quality Forum for two seconds knows that we think that the healthcare system has to be reimagined, uh, that it was born during a period of segregation and inequalities and inequities. Uh, and so uh, we need to open up our minds and, and free ourselves and give ourselves permission uh, to think about um, how do we be more inclusive. And, as, and this conversation about real world evidence, I think is part of that reimagining process. Mm -hmm. um, historically, uh, uh, we have used randomized clinical trials uh, to, to bring new therapies uh, and to do scientific research. Uh, and you know, the, the challenge has been uh, with those uh, randomized trials is that they've not been diverse and we've been really struggling uh, to get them um, diverse. But beyond that, they're incredibly slow, right? I mean, uh, uh, a randomized clinical trial takes a while to do. And in, in my mind, speed, all deliberate speed is important, particularly when mm -hmm. we're talking about lives. And one of the things that COVID taught us is that we can actually fly the plane and build it simultaneously. And so one of the ways that we learned to do that with COVID was by using real world evidence uh, by, uh, and, and not just in, in, in therapies, we, we also use it, those EUAs, those medical devices, that, that was real world evidence. Some of them didn't work and some of them worked, uh, but the point was uh, uh, with, the, with the virus, we couldn't delay. It was forcing us to come out of our comfort zone and do something different. Mm -hmm. and, and that I think is the conversation we're having here. Um, we have to get out of our comfort zone. I know a lot of people, uh, and, and, and for good reason, um, stand by uh, randomized clinical trial, and I do as well. I think, I think they're important, uh, uh, particularly in the early part of, of, of discovery when you, we, you're really concerned about safety uh, and you want to make sure uh, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, any new innovative therapy is, is safe. Um, but at some moment, um, uh, we have to broaden it out um, so that uh, we close that, that, that time loop between uh, discovery and bedside. And one mm -hmm. of the things that real world evidence does for us, it allows us to get to bedside quicker. Uh, and uh, these are lives that are at stake. Um, you know, people who have Alzheimer's 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's a life-threatening disease. And they don't have the time. Um, uh, uh, they need our help immediately. It, it, it doesn't um, uh, uh, have the same immediate challenge as COVID did. But nonetheless, the, the, the effect is still the same. And I think for minority communities, for our community, uh, where we've got disparities all over the place, right? Yeah. Uh, we need speed. We need to do now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's incredibly important uh, that um, uh, we use the technology, the information age, all of the tools at hand that real evidence provides to change the paradigm, uh, to, to get um, good products and services to our community as quickly as possible. So we are excited about this conversation uh, with, um, with Biogen. Uh, you know, for those of us who know about sickle cell, well, some of those sickle cell oh, yeah. medicines have come because of real world evidence, right? We didn't have time to wait. Uh, and so uh, it is not just a conversation about Alzheimer's, it's a conversation about sickle cell and, and diabetes and a whole range of diseases where we can do better. And so in my mind, this is part of the reimagining process. This is a, this is a part of, of coming out of our comfort zone and saying, you know, we could try something else, we could do something else uh, and really help a lot of people along the way. Uh, and so I think this is, a, this is the beginning of a, of, a, of a good conversation about how do we restructure our healthcare system to make sure it's providing quality care for everyone. Dr. Puckern, I, I love the way that you put it in terms of reimagining and restructuring, which really also begs the point that we've had a lack of imagination in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. With respect mm -hmm. to how, uh, how people, how patients and caregivers are engaged in clinical trial participation. And so mm -hmm. Dr. Radha Krishnan, I want to ask you in general, what are the challenges that patients and caregivers face, you know, in, in terms of uh, barriers to clinical trial participation and going back to real world evidence, how do those studies, how do w, RWE studies make it so that it's a supplemental, um, it's, a, it's a good addition to uh, providing information for clinical trials yeah, so that we can get at that reimagining. Thank you. And I absolutely loved how Dr. Puckran talked about reimagining, restructuring, and really thinking through how do you really optimize the data that you get from randomized clinical studies and make sure that the data gets generalizable to the broader patient population. Dr. Puckran, you're spot on. It goes beyond Alzheimer's. It touches sickle cell. It touches MS. It touches lupus. I know we're already working on these aspects because uh, patients know no boundaries. They know bound, no boundaries in terms of diseases, conditions, and therapeutic areas. The job for us is cut, right? In terms of the question you asked about the issues, there are major access issues that we are dealing with today in terms of clinical studies. Racial equity inequities in clinical trials is a major problem, not just for us, but for the entire industry across all therapeutic areas. We are aware that some of the most common barriers to participating in clinical trials could be something as simple as mistrust of the healthcare system, lack of awareness of what's out there in terms of clinical studies that are recruiting for patients, inadequate information about research and opportunities to participate in these studies, access to proper sites, because I know the NMQF has worked on this phenomenal tool called INDEX, where you're able to, through heat maps, identify <coughs> density, population densities, and demographics of where these patients are. We as an industry need to use those tools. Biogen, I know, has been working with NMQF on this already, but we want to be able to use more of these to essentially really call out where are these sites, where are the specialists, and more importantly, where are these patients? So as we embark on this challenge or this reimagination, as Dr. Pakran put, RWE studies are an excellent solution to really supplement and complement the comprehensive nature of the data gathering effort that's needed as it relates to the diverse patient population in this world, whether it be disease trajectory, whether it be the disease severity, the disease type, or more importantly, the burden the disease places on patients and caregivers, which could be very different as we look at the diverse patient populations. I think it's very important. 
patient journey, we talk a lot about patient journey. Are patient journey similar amongst different types of patients? Certainly not. It depends on a lot of factors. It depends on access to care, socioeconomic factors, also the disease trajectory. So better being able to quantify the disease journey is going to be very, very important. And more importantly, I want to stress this, is when you do RCTs or randomized clinical trials, the environment is so strictly controlled and regulated and the population is so homogeneous that we need to get past that. We need to get into a point of being able to gather data that is meaningful to real world clinical practice, meaningful to the large populations we need to study, and also collect data that is routinely collected as part of standard of clinical care to minimize the burden on patients and their families and ability of healthcare providers to be able to generate data that will allow them to make meaningful clinical decisions. Dr. Radhakrishnan, what I hear you saying at the end of that especially is that the RCT is not always the best or, or not necessarily the, the, should not be the go-to when you're talking about challenging populations or populations that historically have challenges with accessing clinical trials. Yeah, RCTs, absolutely, Mia. RCTs are the gold standard to seek regulatory approval, which is why we have strict inclusion exclusion criteria, which is why we go about understanding the benefit risk profile in a very homogeneous population. But once that is done, we really need to start looking to optimizing. And as Dr. Puckerin said, research to bedside. I usually say bench to bedside and then take it to the next step. I think that is what is core. That's what is fundamental to say, if Dr. Maha is a patient, and if some, if I was not part of a clinical study and I'm being put on a medication, how would this medication impact me, my quality of life? How is this going to be clinically meaningful to me to really be able to help, help my individual patient outcomes? And that's what real world evidence is all about. So let's let's keep let's keep with talking about real world evidence, Dr. Puckrin. Um, tell us, you know, more about real world evidence, data generation, and how communities that are historically marginalized or minoritized can access the, uh, trials. So you know, one of the things that we uh, have to uh, understand is that we're actually in the middle of a medical revolution. It doesn't feel that way, but we we really are. Uh, we're getting very very smart. Um, and our ability to intervene. Um, you know, the president right now is talking about the cancer moonshot. Well, if we don't use real world evidence for the cancer moonshot, it ain't gonna be much of a moonshot, right? And so all, all across our healthcare system, um, the use of real world evidence is going to be important. And what does that mean? What, when we talk about real world evidence, what does it mean? It actually means that when you go to the doctor, and I go to the doctor, and our parents go to the doctors, and our neighbors go to the doctors, we're collecting that data. We're, we're trying to understand, did that medication actually work? Was it safe for them? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, that's the feedback information that comes back into the system, and that's how we learn. That's, that's part of that acceleration process, right? As opposed to setting up a, a, a clinical trial that goes on for five years and you got a narrow population. Uh, once we've demonstrated safety and some efficacy, um, showing some real signals um, that uh, the medication or the intervention is going, is going to be effective, um, it, it's trying to put it out in the real world and see if it in fact works. Uh, for minority populations, anyone who knows NMQF we're going to get that data to you. We're going to, we're going to make sure uh, that you're well informed about the data. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're not shy. We will tell legislators, uh, here's, what the, here's what the data says. Uh, we interact with organized medicine, uh, and we'll, you know, have a conversation about that. Because at the end of the day, it's a learning community. It's, it's all of us learning together to mm -hmm. affect real, in, real and positive change. There are lots of people, old school, um, who want to do it the old way, and I understand that. Uh, but my, my thought of it is, man, by the time we get to 2050, we don't want to deal with Alzheimer's anymore, right? I mean, we, you know, we got to put a clock on this thing. And so part of good medicine is deliberate speed. It's not to say that you're going to be careless, that you're going to be put people at risk. Uh, but you're going to do things in a way that mm -hmm. allows you to learn quickly, 
uh, get that information out to community uh, and so that people can be comfortable that the healthcare system that they are working with is lowering their risk. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's our sense of, of why this real world evidence is so really important in terms of changing the way we do business around here. Dr. Maha, well, to that point, you know, about what this moment has taught us and, and where mm -hmm. we hope to go, mm -hmm. um, you know, if if the goal is, as Dr. Puckering put it, we don't want to deal with Alzheimer's in 2050 or 30 years from now, we don't want to talk be talking about inequitable outcomes with respect to health, uh, um, heart disease or cancers, you mm -hmm. know, how, you know, what, what are, what are we doing now that makes outcomes successful? What are, you know, what are some successful ways that we're engaging that Biogen, for instance, or other organizations are engaging underrepresented patients um, and, and their caregivers for research participation? No, I think it's uh, definitely a, a fantastic thing. So I just want to kind of start off maybe by giving a few examples of the work we've been doing in the space across therapeutic mm -hmm. areas. I refer to MS being one of them. So recently at the American uh, MS meeting called we call Actrums, we presented data in partnership with Dr. Pakran and his team, where we talked about how the disease burden is much more severe, much more significant as it relates to the African-American and black patient population and why these patients need to be on disease-modifying therapies from the get-go. It talks to the importance of appropriate and timely diagnosis and being able to be put on disease-modifying therapies. Outside of that, we've also really dug deep into the spinal muscular atrophy space, SMA. Our program, Spinraza, as we call it, has been approved by the regulators in many countries across the globe, but we haven't stopped at that. We said, now, how do we take the data and how do we utilize real world information to really be able to generate information on the use of Spinraza in patients, type three and type four patients. And so as, as a result of this, the data that got generated was able to really provide the evidence and the guidance to be able to optimize our label for the use of Spinraza in adult populations. Lupus is another area, Alzheimer's is another area. We're putting a lot of focus again in terms of uh, three main strategies that we are undertaking because our goal is to really prioritize health equity and diversity in our clinical programs, whether they are randomized control studies or more, more importantly, RWEs. First and foremost, we select the right sites where the staff is diverse, it's located in communities of color, and with access to different patient populations. This is where a tool like index comes to play. Secondly, we're ensuring that we're really supporting the sites in the identification of through outreach and engagement of patients that belong to these underrepresented communities. And what we also do is we deploy tactics that are really aimed at increasing disease awareness. In this case, we just put out a white paper this morning that specifically talks to the activities we're doing in the Alzheimer's space. And it is a press release on the NMQF website for those of you who wanna go and take a look at it. So it's focused on awareness, education, training, but really sponsoring community engagement programs and collaborating with Dr. Pakran's team. You know, we are really hoping that we can really get to our goal of increasing diversity in our clinical trials. We have lofty goals. So in our post-marketing requirement study, we call Envision for Alzheimer's disease, we are hoping to hit 18% in terms of representation from the diverse patient community. In our real world evidence patient registry called iCare AD, we're hoping to hit 16%. This is going away from the traditional two to 3% of diverse patient representation that you see in the, spot, in the clinical trials. So we are not giving up. As Dr. Puckran said, it's time to reimagine, restructure, and rethink the way we've been doing things. And we feel very, very comfortable and very confident that we are on the right path here. One of the ways uh, to reimagine is to consider that our world, our nation, is, for lack of a better phrase, is browning, right? It's becoming more and more brown by um, 2026, a lot of a lot of stats are saying certainly by 2050, um, to use the year that Dr. Puckran called on earlier, our nation will be predominantly of of minority status, and I don't even want to say minor. It will be majority minority, 
you know, in a lot of ways, or it will be the new majority, you know, as Dr. Puckett also uses that term. So how, and you know, so we, we can also consider that we'll be talking about populations whose first language is not, is not English as well, right? So how, what are some ways to think through all of the shifts in demographics um, with respect to access to clinical trials? And that's for either one of you to, to jump in and speak to. Dr. Buckley? Yeah, you okay. You okay, thank you. Yeah, well, again, I think this is, uh, again, a very, very important topic and very timely. So I think this all comes back again to highlighting what the unmet needs are, yeah. where the gaps in care are, and what are the triggers and how do we close those gaps. So for example, what we have begun to do in our company through our medical organization is to really develop educational topics on a wide range of sub <coughs> subjects, starting from what is the, what are the nuances of the patient journey in the under under patient population? How do we put forward trains focused on cultural competencies, cultural humilities, and language barriers? So all of these are TED Talks videos available as part of our roadshows. They're available, and I'm happy to share links to all of that. What is the role of the caregiver, especially as you look at the Alzheimer's disease population, where we understand, because again, based on, I mean, I come from India, my background is different. Each person has a different way of comprehending what the disease means what the laws of cognition or memory means to the family, to the individual patient, to the caregivers around them, impact of the comorbidities in terms of the prognosis and diagnosis. So we wanna be able to remove the stigma of the diagnosis because we are in this era of quickly advancing medicine and technology. So we wanna be able to get the diverse patient populations to a point of understanding the importance of seeking care understanding the importance of participating in clinical studies and real world data generation efforts. And obviously, uh, all of this happens only when we start really reaching out to and empowering those study sites that are sitting in these communities of color, that are sitting in these areas with the highest densities of patient populations that we need to bring in to the clinical trials and the data generation efforts. And lastly, I have to say this is that I personally am quite intrigued by the opportunity the digital solutions are presenting right now, integrating, you know, kind of traditional ways of generating data along with digital. So you all may have heard that Biogen just recently last year embarked on a very innovative study called Intuition with Apple, where we are really looking to passively quantify brain health in individuals. So when I say brain health, it means cognitively normal as well as fo focus on those that may be declining from a cognition standpoint. So passively looking to monitor what's happening in terms of cognition. And I am happy to report that so far based on the data I've seen, we have 30% of people that are self-disclosing themselves to be non-Caucasian. So amongst these, Asians, African-American African Blacks and Latinos, 30%. To me, this was music to my ears when I was talking to the team that's managing this. That's wonderful. So we are on the right path, you know? So we need to just keep keep pushing on this topic. Dr. Uh, Parker, did you have something else to yeah, add? Thank I, you for I, that, Dr. Maha. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would add this. Um, I, I think we've got a pathway uh, with real world evidence and uh, that will allow us to bring more communities into the clinical trial world. Mm -hmm. um, I think it will help accelerate um, uh, knowledge generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it will meet some of what you're talking ab about when you have a diverse co country. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, like California is diverse. Texas is already diverse. Georgia is diverse. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about what's yeah. happening right now. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so we have all of those communities uh, of, of any uh, mm -hmm. color or, or, or really whatever when they come into the healthcare system, um, yeah. it's, it's our job to make sure that they get quality care and that mm -hmm. the science is moving along to do that. Uh, I would open one other door in this reimagining, and I know this is, uh, this is a tough door, uh, but our healthcare financing system ain't keeping pace, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's an old system. And it is, you know, when, you, when we look at it, what we see is a system that is not keeping pace with innovation. Uh, that is holding us back. 
and somehow that's got to be part of the reimagining system. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, you know, HICFA, CMS, it's, to me, it's the same thing. Um, they need to be part of the future. Uh, and so uh, I know this is a tough conversation, uh, but uh, we can't get there if we if our financing system is holding us back and keeping and not keeping pace. Think about this for a second. In the computer world, right, 1970, we were we were dealing with these with these laptops. Look at where we are now, right? Um, because uh, we were allowed knowledge was allowed to grow, competition, all of those sorts of things. So, from an NMQF perspective, uh, when we say reimagine, we're talking about freeing ourselves to really reimagine uh, and try to find new pathways forward. I think uh, the randomized clinical trials will start us down that pathway, yeah. but we've got other work that we have to do in order to get the system fully going so it can run full blast and we can take care of some of these diseases mm-hmm. that trouble us. Mm-hmm. 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 You know, we're, we're talking about innovation, we're talking about reimagination, real world evidence. The other thing we really have to loop into this conversation is the very real significant existence of bias, right? And when I say bias, I'm specifically talking about conscious bias, unconscious mm-hmm. bias, although for the most part, I'm, I'm specifically talking about uh, conscious bias, right? Mm-hmm. And so how, how do we see real world data, real world, world evidence, helping to resolve bias um, as, you know, that's been highlighted as a challenge with with respect to existing um, AI, augmented intelligences and, and other tools. You know, how do we get at that bias piece if we're talking about reimagining a culture that uh, brings us to a space of more holistic health? So our our healthcare system right now, the legacy system that we work with, uh, is really focused on financial risk. Um, If you you pay really close attention to it, uh, a lot of what it's talking about and and when when it talks about innovation, it's talking about payment reform. Uh, What it's not talking about is patient risk. Mm. Uh, And if our healthcare system is built around patient risk, and that is the value, the value is in reducing patient risk, I think the biases will take care of themselves, right? Because the way you get rewarded in a patient risk system is lowering patient risk. And at the end of the day, uh, you don't care who that patient is. You're about the business of lowering their risk. And and I think that's part of that reimagining. How are we thinking about the problem? Because Mm -hmm. Every patient that I know, including myself, that goes into a healthcare system expects it to be lowering their risk. I can't imagine anybody who goes yeah. into a healthcare system with the expectation that their risk is going to be elevated. Uh, and if you think about it and frame it in that way, you, you understand the value of real world e- uh, evidence. Yeah. You understand what we're really financing in healthcare. Uh, and so I, I think that's part of the the whole conversation um, that we need to have. Um, I don't think we're going to get into men's souls and change whatever they think about whatever they think about. Uh, But what we can do is reward work that is on point. And I think for a healthcare system, lowering patient risk is is probably the best value we can have. Yeah, and if I may just add to Dr. Puckrin's excellent remarks here, you know, lowering patient risk is front and center to why we practice medicine, right? And lowering patient risk means an urgent call to action that we don't see in front of our eyes each and every day patients transitioning from one stage of the disease to other without access to available treatment options. So if I take the case of Alzheimer's, 1,000 patients a day transition from one stage to the other which essentially deprives them of the opportunity to seek treatment that has been approved for the early stages of illness. And as a provider, as a physician myself, as someone with family members and as someone who personally could end up having, I think this needs to change. And this is where the reimagination needs to come. This is where we need to ensure the patient risk is minimized 
while we really try to characterize the effectiveness of medications in the real world as it relates to a broad population of patients. <laughs> you know, the value, and Dr. Pakran talked about payment and value. What real world evidence also offers to us is not just generating efficacy and safety and adherence data, but also pharmacoeconomic data, health resource utilization data. So if you look at the rich Medicare claims database, it gives us medical claims, pharmacy claims, lab claims, but also indirect ways to look at direct and indirect costs. So I feel honestly that the way we move this along and speed up the revolution needed in advancing medicine and science is honestly saying real world evidence is a complement, it's a continuum to RCTs, but we really need to push this. Patient risk should not be at stake here. Yeah, I, I truly appreciate you being very clear on that, Dr. Radhakrishnan. You're talking about the role of people's actual stories and the lives that they live, and also taking the uh, the sheer numbers, right, and the, the sheer yes. data in, in that way. So, yes, they, they do have to complement one another. I want to now turn to some questions from the audience, and I'll reiterate. If you do have questions, um, audience members, please place them in the Q&A box below on your screen. And feel free to keep the conversation going amongst yourselves on the side in the chat. So one of our attendees is, is uh, curious about how, how organization companies like pharma and, and or big pharma in general, but organizations like Biogen, mm -hmm. um, and I'll also say organizations like NMQF mm -hmm. are helping FQHCs, so federally qualified health centers, to really understand the ways in which products um, are approved through the FDA process, right? Mm -hmm. Because the point that they're making is that sometimes these FQHCs, a large amount of which are in um, are in not just urban centers, but in in uh, locales where um, the patient population is one mm -hmm. such that they often lack access to care. Mm -hmm. Those companies or those hospitals don't always understand the FDA process or the the um, approval process for medicines and for devices and such like that. So how is Biogen and NMQF positioned to help these centers understand uh, more broadly what FDA does yeah. in a way that serves their population? Yeah, thank you. Maybe Dr. Pakran, if I may take that first. Sure. 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 So I think uh, what you will see in our white paper that just got published this morning also touches on many aspects of the question you just asked Mia. You know, we all know that the FDA approval process is a very highly regulated, highly stringent, highly thoughtful process of getting products to the market, making sure that there is an appropriate benefit risk profile there. What we need to do now, which we have kind of sort of touched on in the white paper, is really call out what happens after. You know, we have touched on aspects of accelerated approval, which was the case for our Alzheimer's product, Aducanumab, essentially talking about the reason we got accelerated approval, but now what we need to do as a next step. I think it's up to us to educate the population on examples we have seen from other therapeutic areas, examples we've seen in the area of oncology, multiple myeloma, for example, where products that got accelerated approval from the FDA to be able to be prescribed in the general population, then ended up generating so much real world evidence that you actually see that from a morbidity mortality standpoint, patients who live for just two years after diagnosis, today can live eight, 10 and plus years more. It's because we have data on a multitude of aspects in patient populations. We are not just relying on the initial approvals of looking at treatment response or time to progression. We have gotten to the point of overall progression, progression-free survival, right? The same applies to areas like cystic fibrosis. Dr. Pakran kind of reminded me of this the other day. He talked about how registries in these areas are helping people understand better how to evolve treatment guidelines how to evolve quality measures, HEDIS measures. So it's upon us, to your question, to educate, increasing awareness. So uh, the videos I mentioned, the, the, the TED Talks I mentioned, they, they touch on a lot of these aspects. But I think that this cannot be just Biogen and NMQF alone. It has to be the entire community working hand in hand with us to really um, help people understand and make them aware of what is it 
what does it take to get a product through regulatory approval and then what does it take to really optimize the life cycle of a product as it relates to the different patient populations and communities that we're talking about and what we'll do for the audience dr radhakrishnan is work with you to get those um links to those ted talks that you mentioned and put that right in the uh, chat and if we don't get that to you all today today's talk then we can for sure follow up with you um through our people who are running the uh the chat today i want to stay with this conversation on industry public private partnership right what does that look like between a biogen and an nmqf practically speaking right from from thought origin to execution to plans for the future, what does that look like? Uh, I'm, I'm going to take the question uh, and also uh, uh, respond a little bit to the prior question uh, that you asked, because um, COVID had a deep impact on the National Minority Quality Forum. Um, uh, uh, a number of members of Congress reached out to us in the middle of the pandemic uh, because in the minority community, particularly African Americans, if you remember, the mortality rates were shooting through the roof, the hospitalizations, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> and so it, it brought us into contact with FQACs. Uh, we, were, we were down in community uh, working with FQACs, and we had a couple of takeaways. One is that here are these trusted voices in community, but there was a lot of disinformation that they were dealing with in community, and, and they didn't have the social media capabilities uh, to, to, to push back, to educate uh, their community. I mean, if you remember, you had some very responsible people telling blacks not to get vaccinated, right? <laughs> and so um, we built a whole social media program uh, mm -hmm. in order to link those FQACs together uh, and do all of the back-end analytics for them um, mm -hmm. so that they could uh, provide trusted information uh, to their communities. But we took it a step further. On Monday, we're launching something called For Your Health News. And what we're doing is, uh, it's a news aggregation site and we're pulling news from 80,000 different sources. It's curated mm -hmm. so that there's trusted information about health now available um, uh, in our communities. But we've taken it a step further. This, this whole conversation about clinical trials um, I had uh, the good fortune to write uh, 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 a, a commentary with uh, Janet Woodcock, who was then um, uh, commissioner at FDA, about the need to get community clinicians into clinical trials. Uh, and um, uh, because they're in, they're in community, they're trusted voices, uh, and it was spot on. So we launched something called the Alliance for Representative Clinical Trials, ARC in which we are training community clinicians to be PIs. And we are working with FQACs. We're going out to FQACs uh, and we're looking at their practices and saying, so how can we strengthen, how can we harden them so that they can do clinical trials? How do we train your staff? How do we train you? How do we support you in, in doing those clinical trials? And that is the conversation that we're having yeah. with Biogen to be partner yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with that so that we are bringing those trials into community. And those are those randomized clinical trials that we're talking about. So we're not saying don't do randomized clinical trials. We're saying, yeah, we, have, we ought to have those um, diverse as well. But then we can do the, 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 the randomized, the, the real world evidence, because guess what? Uh, those FQACs, they're collecting data, the uh, minority physician, the minority serving physicians in practice are collecting data. Yeah. And we, we want to try to link uh, the uh, referring physicians. So we have a whole program uh, with Biogen in which we are bringing referring physicians, yes. principal investigators, patient advocates in community to talk about, so how do we expedite? How do we make sure that our clinical trials uh, can happen quickly, uh, that we take that learning and we get it back out to community? Um, so we're just not talking about uh, reimagining. We are reimagining. We are doing. And so we're really pleased to have that relationship uh, with Biogen because that's the way it's going to have to get done. Uh, we're all going to have to do what we do best and collaborate uh, and bring real new resources and opportunities into our communities. And if I may just um, add to what Dr. Pokhran so eloquently called out and stated, I think I'm also equally excited by the power of data. 
And the reason I say this is that the more evidence we collect and the more evidence we put on a joint data sharing platform that is accessible by everyone, the more we are able to really bring medicine and science to the patients. The more we are able to open the eyes and empower patients to make the calls on having those informed discussions with your treatment providers in terms of what treatment options are there for them and what choices do they have and what decisions can be made jointly with your treatment providers. So this concept of developing a learning health system that's become quite a talk right now. This is something that we are very engaged on, you know, and your question about the NMQF Biogen Partnership, it's a meeting of visionaries, if I may. It's a meeting of scientific experts sitting at the table, talking through what is it going to take that in the next 10, five years, 10 years to really revolutionize the way we look at medicine. You know, and as I said, the white paper this morning is focused on Alzheimer's disease, but our work goes way beyond that you know, in all our areas of focus. And uh, I feel extremely honored, you know, to be able to partner with Dr. Pakran and his team on this project. Your, your excitement is so palpable there, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Let's stay with what you were talking about, because I think what you, were, what you were saying also answers one of the questions that um, one of our audience members brought up. And basically they say, you know, can real world evidence help to democratize health data? You know, do you want to do you want to expand on that a bit? Yep. Yeah, no, I think I thought that was a fantastic question. By the way, all the questions coming in are great. Um, so um, it can. Yes. So I can go start off with some examples. So several years ago, what Biogen launched was a, 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 a platform and a data platform aggregating data from centers of academic excellence called MS Paths. MS Paths was in the area of multiple sclerosis. What it offered is creating an infrastructure, a data platform to be able to gather real world data from patients that are being treated at these centers of care. Clinical measures, patient measures, biomarker measures that included imaging and plasma biomarkers. We have taken all of this data and working with investigators, working with sites, really taken that and almost like it's like a clinical disease research network concept, analyzed it. Over the years, we've had multitudes of publications come out. So the data is available back to the physician community, to the patient community, to the payers and all other stakeholders. So in terms of being able to democratize the data, this is exactly where we wanna go. We wanna use real world evidence as a means to generate data, but not just generate, but openly share. We wanna be able to, within the guidance of HIPAA and privacy, et cetera, still be able to share anonymized information that will help physicians and healthcare providers make the right call in terms of what, what medicine is right for what patient and at what point of time. Dr. Buckran, I don't know if you would like to add to that. Oh, um, you know, I, 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 I love what you're describing because that is the future, right? You're, you're laying in front of us of what our future is. And we just have this enormous untapped capabilities of that in partnership. I'm talking about the collective we, we can really uh, uh, do so much. And we need to bring those policy makers along with us too, right? They gotta be part of the, they gotta be part of the conversation and part of the future because, um, you know, healthcare is about healthcare policy uh, as well. And so, um, this reimagining has to go across the whole system. Uh, uh, as Mia so aptly said, uh, America is becoming more diverse. The inequalities that existed in the past cannot stand, right? And so therefore, we all have to collectively uh, roll up our sleeves. And also that whole democratization of, of data. If you remember in COVID, uh, the, the conversations that went on about vaccine hesitancy, right? Here's a mm -hmm. vaccine that's actually going to save your life, yes. but people are befuddled by it because we didn't do a good job educating them. I think we have to take the ownership of that, right? And, and so part of what we have to do here is make sure that the information is accessible to all Americans in a way in which they can actually use it, right? And so I think that's part of the, the challenge is to make sure that we 
get the information out to everyone. When we were working with those FQHCs, one of the things we found out is nobody told them about monoclonal antibodies, right? Here are these African Americans who are dying, who didn't have to die if mm -hmm. someone would just give them a monoclonal antibody, right? That's on us. Uh, yeah. That's on us, right? Yeah. That's a healthcare system that's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. <laughs> and so that's why I think uh, it, it's a whole system reimagining that needs yeah. to happen uh, because we can do better than, than what we're doing right now. And that gets at a question that someone else asked about the marketing challenges, right? It, mm -hmm. It's really, it's really a, a, it's really a language barrier in and of itself. How do, how do we, how do we bring these large concepts, multisyllabic mm -hmm. words and medicines yeah. to a space where, and I, and I refuse to say down to, right? Now I'm just saying to a space, right? Where we're mm -hmm. transferring it mm -hmm. from a traditional clinical model into spaces where people already exist, because as you mentioned. COVID completely changed everything, right? Such that the, the medical establishment has to come to where the people are. We've known that beforehand, but we especially know it now, or hopefully we know it now um, after COVID. So how do we, how do we help to um, engage? Does, the, does it take engaging people who are, who are already the um, marketing experts or do we, do we demand of those who are in the traditional clinical setting to become better communicators and, and make that a part of traditional um, uh, teaching trajectories? Or, 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 you know, what do we do? Yeah, I mean, I think, and if Dr. Pakran, if I may, I think it's, uh, again, one of a very, very relevant question. It all comes back to education awareness. It all comes back to making sure the right resources are available. It all comes back to cultural training. I talked about it, cultural and competency training, you know, in terms of what people need to do, why, when, and how, you know, that's very important. I think the other aspect of trying to embark on this ambitious venture is also saying, we need to move away from traditional ways of accessing data, pr practicing medicine. What COVID has also taught us is the benefits and the criticality of telemedicine remote patient monitoring, utilizing techniques where you can reach out and access patients in the most rural of areas, right? So, you, and someone asked for the link to the white paper and thank you uh, for providing that, Brandon. I think what you need to read in that is what we're proposing is a CDRN or a clinical disease research network, which essentially moves away from the traditional data capture happening at institutions to a digital way of capturing solutions through iPads, et cetera, where you can continue to monitor the state of health of patients, even though they're not coming into the clinic on a regular basis. And that's the only way you can reach out to the populations that are sitting in areas where they don't have access to centers of academic excellence. These are not the patients that are sitting in the hospital-based outpatient settings. These are not patients sitting in traditional infusion centers. These are patients that are sitting far out. And how do we get to them? And which is where the arc that uh, Dr. Pakran can, you know, he talked about already to me is foundational. Training investigators, on the importance of real world evidence and data capture, training investigators on the criticality of the nuances of what it takes to deal with diverse patients and their families and caregivers. And, and making, making that training not something that they look at and say, okay, this is just a supplement that I have to, I have to complete, right? It's not no. just a, a box that I have to check. Yeah. This is something that you have to develop an expertise in and it must be, be something that you value along with every every other part of your training. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the, one of the one of the other another attendee asked a question about whether or not pharma has an obligation to be doing this work at the community level. And I, I must harken back to what Dr. Puckard said. Um, COVID has changed everything. Biogen, you do not have an obligation, but as Dr. Puckard mentioned, it really is the collective we. It has everything to do with all of us rolling up our sleeves, right? But I feel like I'm yeah. putting words in your mouth, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Why don't, why don't you please tell us a bit about that? Mia, what you're saying is music to my ears. What I'm seeing on the chat and questions honestly makes me so happy that we have people on this call that who feel it's a collective mission. It's an obligation on each and every one of us to really focus on this as the top priority. 
patients cannot wait and should not wait. Patients in the real world are not the patients that are in the clinical studies or RCT. Patients in the real world are the ones that truly deserve evidence generation through real world evidence approaches. And it's upon all of us to collectively look to do this. I, th I think there's, um, I'm reading the chat. I think, I think there's, a, there's a significant point being made, um, a critical question, whether or not COVID did actually change everything. And what I mean by, and, and I don't, I don't want to speak for Dr. Parker and, and Dr. Radhakrishnan, so I'll open it up for you two to to expound on what you mean by it. But when I say that COVID changes everything, I mean now we have businesses, because to be real, Biogen is a company that has commercial interests, as do other organizations like it, right? And we have to be, and and, and healthcare as an institution has commercial interests as well, right? So when we can be frank about the fact that the healthcare system has to generate, and by generation, I'm, I'm speaking specifically of currency, right? But now what COVID has done is it's highlighted a lot of the issues that have been ongoing, but now it also puts these, these companies in a space where they can say to themselves, how can we also make certain that equity and the economics meet, right? Because it's not like like we're completely ignoring the fact that there's a there's a dollar bottom line. We can't do that. That would just that would be ridiculous. Um, but Dr. Buckman, you mentioned earlier about the reimagination of the you know financing of healthcare, right? That has to have an equitable bend. That's really what COVID has changed. The fact that you have to have the conversation about where. What, how how is money driven or where are we putting the value literally and figuratively with respect to equitable care if, if you think about it you know healthcare is a collaboration right um th there are so many different collaborators down to the voters vote uh, they are collaborating uh in the healthcare process and the way in which we've designed our society it's a free market economy uh, because we believe that that's the best way to innovate. Uh, and so I strongly uh, believe in that. Uh, but mm -hmm. I also believe that we have a collective responsibility to, to each other uh, to make sure that in the area of healthcare, everybody who comes into the healthcare system gets quality care. And we have enough resources. We can do that. We're smart enough uh, to get that done. Uh, and But that's part of, it takes a plan. You know, it, it just it just doesn't happen. It takes a plan, and we have all of these tools in our hands, and more to come. Uh, if you're watching the marketplace, you see all these bio uh, uh, bio market devices that we're starting to get. Uh, we're going to be, you know, uh, uh, you look at uh, uh, CGMs, those continuous glucose monitors for mm -hmm. diabetes. Well, there are going to be lots and lots of things yeah. uh, like that, and so that's our future. That's what we're trying to get to, uh, mm -hmm. but we can't get to it uh, if we don't free ourselves a little bit from the old system. And yeah. I know it's hard for people. They, you know, mm -hmm. I've been doing it this way forever, and I don't want to change right now. I get it, right? But it's in our collective interest um, yeah. to move this conversation uh, forward aggressively. And so, NMQF, that's what we're committed to. We are committed to a reimagining of the healthcare system so that there aren't any inequities in the system, uh, that we are looking at patient risks squarely in the eye yeah. and saying we have to reduce risk for everyone. That's the job of a healthcare system. We won't have a healthcare system really if we decide we're going to elevate risk for patients. And unfortunately, that's what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Radha Christian, any closing remarks from you before I also uh, close this out? No, thank you, Mia. Dr. Pakran, thank you so much for this opportunity to join you. Uh, feel quite fortunate. As I said, I want to reiterate our emphasis on health equity and diversity through real world evidence generation that is quite consistent with the calls for leadership and coordinated action in accordance with the principles that have been outlined in 2016 by senior officials from the FDA, the CMS, NIH, ARC, Department of Veteran Affairs, and other health agencies. 
Um, all I can say is all of these real world evidence generation efforts are intrinsically adaptable to really address the needs, the questions, the concerns of the treatments in the environment, mm -hmm. as we say, the white paper is talking about Alzheimer's disease as it relates to Alzheimer's and all other therapeutic areas. And ultimately, what is it going to take to really take a treatment that are got approved and optimize it for use in the real world? So with that, um, all I can say is I thank you all for your attention. I remain available to answer any and all questions that come through us through um, Brandon, Dr. Pakran's team, and Mia. It's a pleasure to be able to join you and Dr. Pakran on this conversation. I wish we had an additional hour because there's so many other questions yes. that we could have we could have um, addressed today. I, I think again to harken back to what I said at the opening, we're just going to have to continue this conversation in April. So we hope that you all will join us in the the Health Leadership Summit and the health, the Spring Health Brain Trust. Uh, in April, Brandon can, can tell us finally just more about that. Yes, and we will see Dr. Maha at the summit. Uh, and finally, um, Dr. Puckrin and to the NMQF family, thank you as always for such a fantastic virtual platform. This is also something that came came about as a as a result of the times, uh, the the earliest times of COVID. But um, but we are going to continue on with this level of engagement because it, it does help us to reach even more people. So thank you for your for your energy audience. Um, we'll see you on Fridays to come, and we'll certainly see you in April. And Brandon, are you here to close us I'm out? Or should I go ahead? I am here. I am here. All right. So now you did. You could have done it. You've done a great job with everything else, Mia. Just really appreciate you and your time, and um, Dr. Maha and Dr. Puckrin, and uh, also everybody in the background. It's uh, Keiko who manages and gets everything done and gets out like is uh, paying great attention and making sure all the uh, giving you links to things. So I appreciate her and then Ben from the Biogen team. So if, uh, if I look forward to seeing you virtually next week and then in person again in April. So just a quick thank you to me. It's so good to see you again. Oh, um, okay. I love these conversations with you. And Dr. Ron Krishna, thank you so much. And, and the team at Biogen, uh, it's really been just a great collaboration and, and we look forward to the future. So thank you so much. Right. Thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Wishing you all a wonderful weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Enjoy staying. Yes. <laughs> I'm back tomorrow. I'm back in Boston tomorrow. Oh, okay. Can't wait to be back home. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.